Kwonga the Huntsman, with whom Fidos and Ebert Zanth were two of the most enterprising jewelers in Iqua, had crossed the borders of a region into which men went but seldom, and wherefrom they returned even more rarely. Traveling north from Iqua, they had passed into desolate Muthalon, where the great glacier Polarion had rolled like a frozen sea upon wealthy and far-famed cities, covering the broad isthmus from shore to shore beyond fathoms of perpetual ice. The shell-shaped domes of Cerngoth, it was fabled, could still be seen deep down in the glaciation, and the high, keen spires of Ogonzai were embedded therein together with Fern Palm and Mammoth, and the square black temples of the god Sothagwa. All of this had occurred many centuries ago, and still the ice, a mighty glittering rampart, was moving south upon deserted lands. Now, in the path of the embattled glacier, Kwonga led his companions on a bold quest. Their object was nothing less than the retrieval of the rubies of King Halor, who, with the wizard Omam Vog and many full caparisoned soldiers, had gone out five decades before to make war upon the polar ice. From this fantastic expedition, neither Halor nor Omam Vog had come back, and the sorry, ragged remnant of their men at arms returning to Iqua, after two moons, had told a dire tale. The army, they said, had made its encampment on a sort of knoll, carefully chosen by Omam Vog, in full sight of the Vanward Ice. Then the mighty sorcerer, standing with Halor among a ring of braziers, that fumed incessantly with golden smoke, and reciting runes that were older than the world, had conjured up a fiery orb, vaster and redder than the southward circling sun of heaven. And the orb, with blazing beams that smote from the zenith, torrid and effulgent, had caused the sun to seem no more than a daylight moon, and the soldiers had almost swooned from its heat in their heavy panoply. But beneath its beams, the verges of the glacier melted and ran in swift rills and rivers, so that Halor was for a time hopeful of reconquering Muthalon, over which his forefathers had ruled in bygone ages. The rushing waters had deepened, following past the knoll on which the army waited. Then, as if by hostile magic, the rivers began to give forth a pale and stifling mist that blinded the conjured sun of Omam Vogue, so that its sultry beams grew faint and chill and had power no longer on the ice. Vainly, the wizard had put forth other spells, trying to dissipate the deep and gelid fog. But the vapor drew down, evil and clammy coiling and wreathing like knots of phantom serpents, and filling men's marrows as if with the cold of death. It covered all the camp, a terrible thing even colder and thicker, numbing the limbs of those who groped blindly and could not see the faces of their fellows at arm's length. A few of the common soldiers somehow reached its outer confines and crept fearfully away beneath the wan sun, seeing no longer in the skies the wizard globe that had been called by Omam Vog. And looking back presently, as they fled in strange terror, they beheld, instead of the low-lying mist they had thought to see, a newly frozen sheet of ice that covered the mound on which the king and the sorcerer had made their encampment. The ice rose higher above the ground than a tall man's head, and dimly, in its glittering depth, 
the fleeing soldiers saw the imprisoned forms of their leaders and companions. Deeming that this thing was no natural occurrence, but sorcery that had been exerted by the Great Glacier, and that the glacier itself was a live, malignant entity, with powers of unknown bale. They did not slacken their flight, and the ice had suffered them to depart in peace, as if to give warning of the fate of those who dared to assail it. Some there were who believed the tale, and some who doubted. But the kings that ruled in Iqua after Halor went not forth to do battle with the ice, and no wizard rose to make war upon it with conjured sons. Men fled before the ever-advancing glaciations, and strange legends were told of how people had been overtaken or cut off in lonely valleys by sudden, diabolic shiftings of the ice, as if it had stretched out a living hand. And legends there were, of awful crevices that yawned abruptly and closed like monstrous mouths upon them that dared the frozen waste, of winds like the breath of boreal demons that blasted men's flesh with instant utter cold and turned them into statues hard as granite. In time the whole region, for many miles before the glacier, was generally shunned and only the hardiest hunters would follow their query into the winter-blighted land. Now it happened that the fearless huntsman Iluok, the elder brother of Kwonga, had gone into Muth along, and had pursued an enormous black fox that led him afar on the mighty fields of the ice sheet. For many leagues he trailed it, coming never within bowshot of the beast, and at length he came to a great mound on the plain that seemed to mark the position of a buried hill, and Iluok thought that the fox had entered a cavern in the mound. So, with lifted bow and poised arrow at the string, he went after it into the cavern. The place was like a chamber of boreal kings or gods. All about them, in a dim green light, were huge glimmering pillars, and giant icicles hung from the roof in the form of stalactites. The floor sloped downward, and Iluok came to the cave's end without finding any trace of the fox. But in the transparent depth of the further wall at the bottom, he saw the standing shapes of many men, deep frozen as in a tomb with undecaying bodies and fair, unshrunken features. The men were all armed with tall spears, and most of them wore the panoply of soldiers. But among them in the van, there stood a haughty figure attired in the sea-blue robes of a king, and beside him was bowed an ancient who bore the night-black garb of a sorcerer. The robes of the regal figure were heavenly sewn with gems that burned like colored stars through the ice. Great rubies red as gouts of newly congealing blood were arranged in the lines of a triangle on the bosom, forming the royal sign of the kings of Iqua. So Iluok knew, by these tokens, that he had found the tomb of Halor and Omam Vogue and the soldiers with whom they had gone up against the ice in former days. Overawed by the strangeness of it all, and remembering now the old legends, Iluok lost his courage for the first time, and quitted the chamber without delay. Nowhere could he find the black fox, and abandoning the chase he reached southward, reaching the lands below the greater without mishap. But he swore later that the ice had changed in a weird manner while he was following the fox, so that he was unsure of his direction for a while after leaving the cavern. There were steep ridges and hammocks where none had been before, making his return a toilsome journey, and the glaciation seemed to extend itself for many miles beyond its former limits. And because of these things, 
which he could not explain or understand. A curious, eerie fear was born in the heart of Illuwak. Never again did he go back upon the glacier, but he told his brother Koanga of that which he had found, and described the location of the cavern chamber in which King Halor and Omam Vog and their men-at-arms were entombed. And soon after this, Illuwak was killed by a white bear, on which he had used all of his arrows in vain. Koanga was no less brave than Illuwak, and he did not fear the glacier, since he had been upon it many times and had noticed nothing untoward. His was a heart that lusted after gain, and often thought of the rubies of Halor, locked with the king in eternal ice, and it seemed to him that a bold man might recover the rubies. So, one summer, while trading in Ikua with his furs, he went to the jewelers Bibar Zanth and Hum Fithos, taking with him a few garnets that he had found in a northern valley. While the jewelers were appraising the garnets, he spoke idly of the rubies of Hallower, and inquired craftily as to their value. Then, hearing the great worth of the gems, and noting the greedy interest that was shown by Hum Fithos and Ebor Zanth, he told them the tale he had heard from his brother Illuwak, and offered, if they would promise him half the value of the rubies, to guide them to the hidden cave. The jewelers agreed to this proposition, in spite of the hardships of the proposed journey, and the difficulty they might afterward encounter in disposing surreptitiously of gems that had belonged to the royal family of Ikua, and would be claimed by the present king, Ralor, if their discovery were learned. The fabulous worth of the Rulies had fired their avarice. Kuonga, on his part, desired the complicity and connivance of the dealers, knowing that it would be hard for him to sell the jewelers otherwise. He did not trust Hum Fithos or Eber Zanth, and it was for this reason that he required them to go with him to the cavern and pay over to him the agreed sum of money as soon as they were in possession of the treasure. The strange trio had set forth in midsummer. Now, after two weeks of journeying through a wild subarctic region, they were approaching the confines of the eternal ice. They traveled on foot, and their supplies were carried by three horses little larger than musk oxen. Kwanga, an unerring marksman, hunted for their daily food the hares and waterfowl of the country. Behind them, in a cloudless turquoise heaven, there burned the low sun that was said to have described a loftier ecliptic in former ages. Drifts of unmelting snow were heaped in the shadows of the higher hills, and in steep valleys they came upon the vanward glaciers of the ice sheet. The trees and shrubs were already sparse and stunted, in a land where rich forests had flourished in olden time beneath a milder climate. But poppies flamed in the meadows and along the slopes, spreading their frail beauty like a scarlet rug before the feet of perennial winter. And the quiet pools of stagnant flowing streams were lined with white water lilies. A little to the east, they saw the fuming of volcanic peaks that still resisted the inroads of the glaciers. On the west were high, gaunt mountains whose sheer cliffs and pinnacles were topped with snow, and around those nether slopes the ice had climbed like an inundating sea. Before them was the looming, crenellated wall of the realm-wide glaciation, moving equally on plain and hill, uprooting the trees, and pressing the soil forward in vast folds and ridges. Its progress had been stayed a little by the northern summer. Kuanga and the jewelers as they went on came to turbid rills, made by a temporary melting, 
that issued from beneath the glittering blue-green ramparts. They left their pack horses in a grassy valley, tethered by long cords of elf thong to the dwarvish willows. Then, carrying such provisions and other equipment as they might require for a two days journey, they climbed the ice slope at the point selected by Kuonga as being the most readily accessible, and started in the direction of the cave that had been found by Iluwak. Kuonga took his bearings from the position of the volcanic mountains, and also from two isolated peaks that rose on the sheeted path to the north like the breasts of a giantess beneath her shining armor. The three were well equipped for all the exigencies of their search. Kwonga carried a curious pickaxe of finely tempered bronze to be used in disentombing the body of King Haldor, and he was armed with a short, leaf-shaped sword, in addition to his bow and quiver of arrows. His garments were made from the fur of a giant bear, brown-black in color, whom Phethos and Ebor Zanth, in raiment heavily quilted with eater down against the cold, followed him complainingly but with avaricious eagerness. They had not enjoyed the long marches through the desolate, bleakening land, nor the rough fare and exposure to the northern elements. Moreover, they had taken a dislike to Kwonga, whom they considered rude and overbearing. Their grievances were aggravated by the fact that he was now compelling them to carry most of the supplies, in addition to the two heavy bags of gold which they were to exchange later for the gems. Nothing less valuable than the rubies of Haldor would have induced them to come so far, or to set foot on the formidable wastes of the ice sheet. The scene before them was like some frozen world of the outer void, Vast, unbroken, save for a few scattered mounds and ridges, the plain extended to the white horizon and its armored peaks. Nothing seemed to live or move on the awful glistening vistas, whose nearer levels were swept clean of snow. The sun appeared to grow pale and chill, and to recede behind the adventurers and a wind blew upon them from the ice, like a breath from abysses beyond the pole. Apart from the boreal desolation and dreariness, however, there was nothing to dismay Kwanga or his companions. None of them were superstitious, and they deemed that the old tales were idle myths, were no more than fear-born delusions. Kwanga smiled commiseratively at the thought of his brother Iluwak, who had been so oddly frightened and had fancied such extraordinary things after the finding of Halor. It was a singular weakness in Iluwak, the rash and almost foolhardy hunter who had feared neither man nor beast. As to the trapping of Halor and Omam Vogue and their army in the glacier, it was plain that they had allowed themselves to be overtaken by winter storms, and the few survivors, mentally unhinged by their hardships, had told a wild story. Ice, even though it had conquered half the continent, was merely ice, and its workings confirmed invariably to certain natural laws. Illuwak had said that the ice sheet was a great demon, cruel, greedy, and loathed to give up that which it had taken. But such beliefs were crude and primitive superstitions, not to be entertained by enlightened minds of the Pleistocene age. They had climbed the rampart at an early hour of the morning. Kwanga assured the jewelers that they would reach the cavern by noon at the latest, even if there should be a certain amount of difficulty and delay in locating it. The plain before them was remarkably free of crevices, and there was little to obstruct their advance. Steering their way with the two breast-shaped mountains for landmarks before them, they come after three hours to a hill-like elevation 
that corresponded to the mound of Iluwak's story. With little trouble, they found the opening of the deep chamber. It seemed that the place had changed little, if at all, since the visit of Iluwak. For the interior, with its columns and pendant icicles, conformed closely to his description, the entrance was like a fanged maw. Within the floor sloped downward at a slippery angle for more than a hundred feet. The chamber swam with a cold and glacious translucency that filtered through the dome-like roof. At the lower end, in the striated wall, Kwonga and the jewelers saw the embedded shapes of a number of men, among which they distinguished easily the tall blue-clad corpse of King Hallor and the dark bowed mummy of Omam Vogue. Beyond these, the shapes of others, lifting their serried spears eternally, and receding downward in stiff ranks through unfathomable depths, were faintly discernible. Halor stood regal and erect, with wide open eyes that stared haughtily as in life. Upon his bosom the triangle of hot and blood-bright rubies smoldered unquenchably in the glacial gloom. And the colder eyes of topazes, of barrels, of diamonds, of chrysolites, gleamed and twinkled from his azure raiment. It seemed that the fabulous gems were separated by no more than a foot or two of ice from the greedy fingers of the hunter and his companions. Without speaking, they stared raptly at the far-sought treasure. Apart from the great rubies, the jewelers were also estimating the value of the other gems worn by Hallor. Those alone, they thought complacently, would have made it worthwhile to endure the fatigue of the journey and the insolence of Kuonga. The hunter, on his part, was wishing that he had driven an even steeper bargain. The two bags of gold, however, would make him a wealthy man. He could drink to his full content the costly wines redder than the rubies that came from far Uzeldarom in the south. The tawny, slant-eyed girls of Iqua would dance at his bidding, and he would gamble for high stakes. All three were unmindful of the eeriness of their situation, alone in that boreal solitude with the frozen dead, and they were oblivious likewise to the ghoulish nature of the robbery they were about to commit. Without waiting to be urged by his companions, Kuonga raised the keen and highly tempered pick of bronze, and began to assail the translucent wall with mighty blows. The ice rang shrilly beneath the pick, and dropped away in crystal splinters and diamond lumps. In a few minutes, he had made a large cavity, and only a thin shell, cracked and shattering, remained before the body of Hallor. This shell Kuonga proceeded to pry off with great care, and soon the triangle of monstrous rubies more or less encrusted still with clinging ice, lay bare to his fingers. While the proud, bleak eyes of Hallor stared immovably upon him from behind their glassy mask, the hunter dropped the pick, and drawing his sharp, leaf-shaped sword from its scabbard, he began to sever the fine silver wires by which the rubies were attached cunningly to the king's raiment. In his haste, he ripped away portions of the sea-blue fabric, bearing the frozen and dead white flesh beneath. One by one, as he removed the rubies, he gave them to whom Phethos, standing close behind him, and the dealer, bright-eyed with avarice, drooling a little with ecstasy, stored them carefully in a huge pouch of mottled lizard skin that he had brought along for this purpose. The last ruby had been secured, and Kuonga was about to turn his attention to the lesser jewels that adorned the king's garments, 
in curious patterns and signs of astrological or hieractic significance. Then, amid their preoccupation, he and whom Phethos were startled by a loud and splintering crash that ended with myriad tinklings as of broken glass. Turning, they saw that a huge icicle had fallen from the cavern dome. At its point, as if aimed unerringly, had cloven the skull of Ebar Zonth, who lay amid the debris of shattered ice with the sharp end of the fragment deeply embedded in his oozing brain. He had died instantly, without knowledge of his doom. The accident, it seemed, was a perfectly natural one, such as might occur in summer from a light melting of the immense pendant. But, amid their consternation, Kuanga and Hum Phethos were compelled to take note of certain circumstances that were far from normal or explicable. During the removal of the rubies, on which their attention had been centered so exclusively, the chamber had narrowed to half of its former width, and had closed down from above, till the hanging icicles were almost upon them, like the clamping teeth of some tremendous mouth. The place had darkened, and the light was such as might filter into arctic seas beneath heavy flows. The incline of the cave had grown steeper, as if it were pitching into bottomless depths. Far up, incredibly far, the two men beheld the tiny entrance, which seemed no bigger than the mouth of a fox's hole. For an instant they were stupefied. The changes of the cavern could admit no natural explanation, and the Hyperboreans felt the clammy surge of all the superstitious terrors that they had formerly disclaimed. No longer could they deny the conscious, animate malevolence the diabolic powers of Bale imputed to the ice in old legends. Realizing their peril, and spurred by a wild panic, they started to climb the incline, whom Phethos retained the bulging pouch of rubies, as well as the heavy bag of gold coins that hung from his girdle and Kuonga had enough presence of mind to keep his sword and pickaxe. In their terror-driven haste, however, both forgot the second bag of gold, which lay beside Eber Zonth, under the debris of the shattered pendant. The supernatural narrowing of the cave, the dreadful and sinister closing down of its roof, had apparently ceased. At any rate, the Hyperboreans could detect no visible continuation of the process as they climbed frantically and precariously toward the opening. They were forced to stoop in many places to avoid the mighty fangs that threatened to descend upon them, and even with the rough tiger-skin buskins that they wore, it was hard to keep their footing on the terrible slope. Sometimes they pulled themselves up by means of the slippery, pillar-like formations, and often Kuanga, who led the way, was compelled to hew hasty steps in the incline with his pick. Whom Phethos was too terrified for even the most rudimentary reflection, but Kuonga, as he climbed, was considering the monstrous alterations of the cave, which he could not align with his wide and various experience of the phenomena of nature. He tried to convince himself that he made a singular error in estimating the chamber's dimensions and the inclination of its floor. The effort was useless. He still found himself confronted by a thing that outraged his reason, a thing that distorted the known face of the world with unearthly hideous madness, and mingled a malign chaos with its ordered workings. After the ascent that was frightfully prolonged, like the effort to escape from some delirious, tedious nightmare predicament. They neared the cavern mouth. There was barely room now for a man to creep on his belly beneath the sharp and ponderous teeth. Koanga, feeling that the fangs might close upon him like those of some great monster, hurled himself forward and started to wriggle through the opening, 
with the most unheroic celerity. Something held him back, and he thought for a moment of stark horror that his worst apprehensions were being realized. He then found his bow and quiver of arrows, which he had forgotten to remove from his shoulders, were caught against the pendant ice. While whom Phethos gibbered in a frenzy of fear and impatience, he crawled back and relieved himself of the impeding weapons, which he thrust before him together, with his pick in a second and more successful attempt to pass through the straight opening. Rising to his feet on the open glacier, he heard a wild cry from whom Phethos, who, trying to follow Kwanga, had become tightly wedged in the entrance through his greater girth. His right hand, clutching the pouch of rubies, was thrust forward from beyond the threshold of the cave. He howled incessantly with half-coherent protestations that the cruel ice teeth were crunching him to death. In spite of the eerie terrors that had unmanned him, the hunter still retained enough courage to go back and try to assist whom Phethos. He was about to assail the huge icicles with his pick, when he heard an agonizing scream from the jeweler, followed by harsh and indescribable grating. There had been no visible movement of the fangs, and yet Kuanga now saw that they had reached the cavern floor, the body of whom Phethos, pierced through and through by one of the icicles, and ground down by the blunter teeth, was spurting blood on the glacier, like the red mist from a wine press. Kuanga doubted the very testimony of his senses. The thing before him was patently impossible. There was no mark of cleavage in the mound above the cavern mouth to explain the descent of those awful fangs before his very eyes but too swiftly for direct cognition. This unthinkable enormity had occurred. Whom Phethos was beyond all earthly help, and Kuanga, now wholly the slave of a hideous panic, would hardly have stayed longer to assist him in any case. But seeing the pouch that had fallen forward from the dead jeweler's fingers, the hunter snatched it up through an impulse of terror mingled greed. And then, with no backward glance, he fled on the glacier toward the low circling sun. For a few moments as he ran, Kuanga failed to perceive the sinister and ill-boding alterations, comparable to those of the cave, which had somehow occurred in the sheeted plain itself. With a terrific shock, which became an actual vertigo, he saw that he was climbing a long, insanely tilted slope above whose remote extreme the sun had receded strangely, and was now small and chill, as if seeing from an outer planet. The sky was very different, though still perfectly cloudless. It had taken on a curious, deathly pallor, a brooding sense of inimical volition, a vast and freezing malignity, seemed to pervade the air and settle upon Kuonga, like an incubus. But more terrifying than all else, in its proof of conscious and malign derangement of natural law, was the giddy poleward inclination that had been assumed by the level plateau. Kuanga felt that creation itself had gone mad, and had left him at the mercy of demonical forces from the godless outer gulfs. Keeping a perilous foothold, weaving and staggering laboriously upward, he feared momently that he would slip and fall and slide back into the ever-arctic depths unfathomable. And yet, when he dared to pause at last, and turned shudderingly to peer down at the supposed descent, he saw behind him an acclivity similar in all respects to the one he was climbing. A mad, oblique wall of ice that rose interminably to a second remote sun. In the confusion of that strange Bulaversamon, he seemed to lose the last remnant of equilibrium, 
and the glacier reeled and pitched about him like an overturning world as he strove to recover the sense of direction that had never before deserted him. Everywhere, it appeared, there were small and wan parhelia that mocked him above unending glacial scarps. He resumed his hopeless climb through a topsy-turvy world of illusion, whether north, south, east, or west he could not tell. A sudden wind swept downward on the glacier. It shrieked in Quonga's ears like the myriad voices of taunting devils. It moaned and laughed and ululated with shrill notes as of crackling ice. It seemed to pluck at Quonga with live, malicious fingers, to suck the breath for which he had fought agonizingly. In spite of his heavy raiment and the speed of his toilsome ascent, he felt its bitter, mordant teeth searching and biting even to the marrow. Dimly, as he continued to climb upward, he saw that the ice was no longer smooth, but had risen into pillars and pyramids around him, or was fretted obscenely into wilder shapes. Immense, malignant profiles leered in blue-green crystal. The malformed heads of bestial devils frowned and rearing dragons writhed immovably along the scarp, or sank frozen into deep crevices. Apart from these imaginary forms that were assumed by the ice itself, Kuonga saw, or believed that he saw, human bodies and faces embedded in the glacier. Pale hands appeared to reach dimly and imploringly toward him from the depths, and he felt upon him the frost-bound eyes of men who had been lost in former years, and beheld their sunken limbs, grown rigid in strange attitudes of torture. Kuonga was no longer capable of thought. Deaf, blind, primordial terrors older than reason had filled his mind with their atavistic darkness. They drove him on implacably, as a beast is driven, and would not let him pause or flag the mocking nightmare slope. Reflection would have told him only that his ultimate escape was impossible, that the ice, alive and conscious and maleficent being, was merely playing a cruel and fantastic game which it had somehow devised in its incredible animism. So, perhaps, it was well that he had lost the power of reflection. Beyond hope and without warning, he came to the end of the glaciation. It was like the sudden shift of a dream which takes the dreamer unaware, and he stared uncomprehendingly for some moments at the familiar Hyperborean valleys below the rampart, to the south, and the volcanoes that fumed darkly beyond the southeastern hills. His flight from the cavern had consumed almost the whole of the long subpolar afternoon, and the sun was now swinging close above the horizon. The parhelia had vanished, and the ice sheet, as if by some prodigious ledger domain, had resumed its normal horizontality. If he had been able to compare his impressions, Kuonga would have realized that at no time he surprised the glacier in the accomplishment of its bewildering supernatural changes. Doubtfully, as if it were a mirage that might fade at any moment, he surveyed the landscape below the battlements. To all appearances, he had returned to the very place from which he and the jewelers had begun their disastrous journey on the ice. Before him, an uneasy declivity, fretted and runnelled, ran down toward the grassy meadows, fearing that it was all deceitful and unreal, a fair beguiling trap, a new treachery of the element that he had grown to regard as a cruel and almighty demon. Kuonga descended the slope with hasty leaps and bounds, even when he stood ankle deep in the great club mosses with leafy millows and sedgy grasses about him, he could not quite believe in the verity of his escape. 
The mindless prompting of a panic fear still drove him on, and a primal instinct equally mindless drew him toward the volcanic peaks. The instinct told him that he would find refuge from the bitter boreal cold amidst their purlios. And there, if anywhere, he would be safe from the diabolical machinations of the glacier. Boiling springs were said to flow perpetually from the nether slopes of these mountains. Great geysers, roaring and hissing like infernal cauldrons, filled the higher gullies with scalding cataracts. The long snows that swept upon Hyperborea were turned to mild rains in the vicinity of these volcanoes. And there a rich and sultry colored flora, formerly native to the whole region but now exotic, flourished throughout the seasons. Kwonga could not find the little shaggy horses that he and his companions had left tethered to the dwarf willows in the valley meadow. Perhaps, after all, it was not the same valley. At any rate, he did not stay his flight to search for them. Without delay or lingering, after one fearful backward look at the menacing mass of the glaciation, he started off in a direct line for the smoke-plumed mountains. The sun sank lower, skirting endlessly the southwestern horizon, and flooding the battlemented ice and the rolling landscape with a light of pale amethyst. Kwonga, with iron thews inured to protracted marches, pressed on in his unremitting terror, and was overtaken gradually by a long, ethereal, tinted twilight of northern summer. Somehow, through all the stages of his flight, he retained the pickaxe, as well as his bow and arrows. Automatically, hours before, he had placed the heavy pouch of rubies in the bosom of his raiment for safekeeping. He had forgotten them, and he did not even notice the trickle of water from the melting of crusted ice about the jewels that seeped upon his flesh from the lizard skin pouch. Crossing one of the innumerable valleys, he stumbled against a protruding willow root, and the pick was hurled from his fingers as he fell. Rising to his feet, he ran on without stopping to retrieve it. A ruddy glow from the volcanoes was now visible in the darkening sky. It brightened as Kwonga went on, and he felt that he was nearing the far-sought, inviolable sanctuary. Though still thoroughly shaken and demoralized by his praetor-human ordeals, he began to think that he might escape from the ice demon after all. Suddenly, he became aware of a consuming thirst to which he had been oblivious heretofore. Daring to pause in one of the shallow valleys, he drank from a blossom-bordered stream. Then, beneath the crushing load of an unconsciously accumulated fatigue, he flung himself down to rest for a while among the blood-red poppies that were purple with twilight. Sleep fell like a soft and overwhelming snow upon his eyelids but was soon broken by evil dreams in which he had still fled vainly from the mocking and inexorable glacier. He awoke in a cold terror, sweating and shivering, and found himself staring at the northern sky, where a delicate flush was dying slowly. It seemed to him that a great shadow, malign and massive, and somehow solid, was moving upon the horizon and striding over the low hills toward the valley in which he lay. It came with inexpressible speed, and the last light appeared to fall from the heavens, chill as a reflection caught in ice. He started to his feet with the stiffness of prolonged exhaustion in all his body, and the nightmare stupefaction of slumber still mingling with his half-awakened fears. In this state, with a mad momentary defiance, he unslung his bow and discharged arrow after arrow, emptying his quiver at the huge, bleak, and formless shadow 
that seemed to impend before him on the sky. Having done this, he resumed his headlong flight. Even as he ran, he shivered uncontrollably with the sudden and intense cold that had filled the valley. Vaguely, with an excess of fear, he felt that there was something unwholesome and unnatural about the cold. Something that did not belong to the place or the season. The glowing volcanoes were quite near, and soon he would reach their outlying hills. The air about him should be temperate, even if not actually warm. All at once, the air darkened before him, with a sourceless blue-green glimmering in its depths. For a moment, he saw the featureless shadow that rose gigantically upon his path and obscured the very stars and the glare of the volcanoes. Then, with the swirling of a tempest-driven vapor, it closed about him, gelid and relentless. It was like phantom ice, a thing that blinded his eyes and stifled his breath, as if he were buried in some glacial tomb. It was cold with a transarctic rigor, such as he had never known, that ached unbearably in all his flesh, and was followed by a swiftly spreading numbness. Dimly, he heard a sound as of clashing icicles, a grinding as of heavy flows, in the blue-green gloom that tightened and thickened around him. It was as if the soul of the glacier, malign and implacable, had overtaken him in his flight. At times he struggled numbly, in half-drowsy terror, with some obscure impulse. As if to propitiate a vengeful deity, he took the pouch of rubies from his bosom with prolonged and painful effort, and tried to hurl it away. The thongs that tied the pouch were loosened by its fall, and Kuonga heard faintly, as if from a great distance, the tinkle of the rubies as they rolled and scattered on some hard surface. Then, oblivion deepened about him, and he fell forward stiffly, without knowing that he had fallen. Morning found him beside a little stream, stark frozen, and lying on his face in a circle of poppies that had been blackened as if by the footprint of some gigantic demon of frost. A nearby pool, formed by the leisurely rill, was covered with thin ice. And on the ice, like gouts of frozen blood, there lay the scattered rubies of Hollower. In its own time, the great glacier, moving slowly and irresistibly southward, would reclaim them.